Every once in a while, you will find a show that will become your obsession. You know what I'm talking about. The water cooler shows, Game of Thrones, The Wire, and of course Breaking Bad are the prime examples. Some are mostly perfect, and some we just try not to talk about. But some shows that are equally as good sometimes just fly under the radar. TV shows that are just as good, if not better than the Breaking Bads of the world. And one such show is called The Shield. This show was something special. To say that The Shield pushed the envelope is an understatement. This series showed the ugly side of crime and law enforcement. Corruption, murder, racism, political machinations, serial killers, and other dark stuff that you would probably not like to hear about. In fact, it's one of those TV shows that I had to take a break from because it just got too intense. But the complex and fascinating characters just brought me back for more. So is The Shield a forgotten brilliant piece of TV, or am I just exaggerating? Let us find out in this episode of Gone, But Not Forgotten. For those who don't know what The Shield is about, let me give you a quick rundown. It follows the daily life of an experimental division of the Los Angeles Police Department, which takes place in the fictional Farmington District, nicknamed the Farm, of the city of Los Angeles. This district is full of murder, sexual predators, gang violence, drug trafficking, and prostitution, and the division works out of a converted church known as the Barn. The Shield was created by Sean Ryan, who has been working in Hollywood since 1997. Believe it or not, his first job was in this now-forgotten animated show starring Louis Anderson called Life with Louis. Yes, the man responsible for one of the grittiest cop shows that ever aired on television started out writing scripts for a kid's cartoon. Soon after, he got a job writing for Nash Bridges, and this is where The Shield was born. After a few years of working on Nash Bridges, Ryan was a bit frustrated. Writing the show had become a bit too formulaic. In every episode, Nash would capture a bad guy and save the day. This became bothersome after he did some police ride-alongs and couldn't write stories reflecting on what he was witnessing. So after he left the show, he decided he wanted to write a script that went completely against that. He said that he was determined to write his frustration out of his system. It was during this time that the Rampart police scandal was exposed. This scandal centered around massive police corruption in Los Angeles, which had a deep impact on the public perception of law enforcement. Sean had just become a father, and he thought about the dangers his little girl would face in the world, saying, quote, I was spending a lot of time thinking about how I was going to keep this little girl safe in the world including theoretical thoughts about if something dangerous threatened her, would I be the civil libertarian I considered myself, or would I want someone like Vic Mackey who took shortcuts? This is reflected in the pilot episode, as this episode revolves around the detectives trying to locate a missing child who was sold to a sexual predator. Once this script was written, Ryan submitted it to a small network called FX. Nowadays, everyone knows that FX is a powerhouse of original programming. But in 2001, the network was seen as a bit of a joke. It had been on the airwaves since 1994, but most of the programming was reruns or little-known comedy shows. In 2001, the head of FX at the time, Peter Liguori, decided to take the network in a new direction. He wanted to shift programming to more adult dramas that could compete with the gritty shows being featured on HBO. So it was the perfect time for Sean Ryan to submit his pilot for review. When Liguori read the script, he was floored. He said that each page was electrifying, and he knew this show was going to be a game changer. So he called up Ryan and told him that he wanted to make the series. Sean thought that Liguori was joking, because what he wrote was too edgy for any non-premium network. But the green light was given, and soon casting began. The most important character that Ryan needed to cast was the main role of the show, Detective Vic Mackey. Mackey was a complex and fascinating character. He was the head of an experimental crime unit called the Strike Team, which used brutal tactics to keep crime down. They used intimidation and physical violence to get their points across. These corrupt officers would also steal and make a side income by having drug dealers pay them a cut of their profits. This was to keep the dealers on a short leash 
to be used for information against gangs and other bigger criminals. Mackey was psychopathic, as he could do truly heinous things, yet keep it compartmentalized to function as a family man. He justified his actions as serving the greater good. So who could play such a character? Well, Sean was looking for a Harrison Ford type of actor, yet the actor who would wind up playing Vic was the complete opposite. Enter Michael Chiklis. Chiklis is an amazing actor who has been working in television and film since 1989. At the time, his biggest role was the lead character in the police comedy, The Commish. After The Commish ended, Michael decided that he wanted to reinvent his image. He was frustrated with the roles that he was being offered and realized he was in danger of being typecast. So he shaved his head and began to work out to build up his physique. It was almost like fate had a hand on him being cast. It turns out that Chiklis and Ryan's wives were childhood friends. So during a jamboree for his kid, he was introduced to Sean, and the conversation soon turned towards Ryan's script. Funny story, Michael initially thought that Sean had written a script about a farmer, since the original name of the shield was called The Barn. But Michael soon got his hands on the script, and instantly knew he had to have this part. When he told his agents, they said that they would make the network an offer, but he insisted that he read for it. At the time, his agents tried to persuade him to not audition since he had already been the lead on another show, but Chiklis insisted. He said that if he didn't read for the role, they would just see him as the commish. So he soon found himself in a room with another actor waiting to go in to audition for Vic. Chiklis said that as he was sitting there, he thought about how he wouldn't get the part, about how he would be disregarded, and he pictured them thanking him and saying, better luck next time. So he got angry and decided that he would take that anger and scare them. Ryan said that he was pacing back and forth, intimidating everyone in the room, and they knew he was perfect for the role. Yet the show almost never came to be. I will let Michael Chiklis himself explain what happened. We shot the pilot for The, the Shield in June of 2001. We were picked up on my birthday, August 30th, 2001, and then 2000, you know, one was 9-11, you know, and uh, that made us all stop and say, are we really going to do this show about this corrupt cop when we just saw images of the most heroic police running into buildings and perishing? And I think we all took a beat and we went, yeah, absolutely. Because now the thematic question was initially, what are we willing to accept from law enforcement to keep us safe? Now becomes, even more significantly, what are we willing to accept from law enforcement in post 9-11 America to keep us safe? So it became even more resonant. Another factor in the show moving forward was the success of the now classic crime thriller, Training Day, which was a huge blockbuster success. So FX moved ahead with the show. The Shield was an ensemble cast, and Vic Mackey couldn't survive without his crew, the Strike Team, a group of detectives that makes up an anti-crime unit created to fight crime in the area. Consisting of detectives Shane Vandrell, Curtis Lem Lemansky, Ronald Gardock, and Terry Crowley. As I stated before, this team was constantly crossing the line and committing flat-out crimes whenever dealing with criminals. They were practically a mafia, as they were loyal to each other to a disturbing level. In the first episode, Vic kills Crowley when he learns that he's an informant, and this shocked viewers. I remember being dumbfounded when I saw Vic shooting Crowley at the end of that pilot. I didn't see it coming. Sean Ryan said that he had only ended the episode with the murder because he thought that he wouldn't get the show picked up. If he knew the show would have gone on so long, he would have made it a storyline all throughout the first season. Still, that moment was when a casual viewer had become a fan. All bets were off. No one was safe. And as the show went on, this was proven over and over again. So now let me proceed to break down the members of the strike team. Shane Vendrell was played by Walton Goggins, a racist scumbag who was also a hypocrite. He would say that he was loyal to his team, but as the show went on, his true colors would show and wind up turning against everyone. The turning point for Shane in the series was when he murdered his friend. 
the conscious and only good soul on the team, Curtis Lem Lemansky. Walton Goggins was amazing on this show, and I became a huge fan. It was his role on The Shield and later Sons of Anarchy that I knew I'd love everything he was in. He went on to have roles in two amazing films from Quentin Tarantino, Django Unchained, and The Hateful Eight. I also loved his starring role in his now cancelled show, The Unicorn. It's so funny because the network actually wanted to fire Walton at the start of season one. They didn't like his look and thought that his character was dead weight. But Sean Ryan knew how amazing of an actor Goggins was, so he and writer Glenn Mazzara rewrote the second and third episode to showcase Walton's acting. The tactic had worked, and FX would make him a series regular. Lem was probably the only compassionate cop on the Strike Force. He was played by Kenneth Johnson, who had originally auditioned for the murdered Terry Crowley, but the producers liked his performance so much that they cast him as Lem instead. It was so tragic when his character was murdered by Shane. Other characters on the show were Captain David Aceveda, played by Benito Martinez. Aceveda was the captain of the barn, and a natural politician. He was constantly trying to further his career, and was at odds with Vic for much of the series. At first, his mission is to take down Vic and the Strike Force, but in a perfect example of the show's ability to turn things upside down, they wind up teaming up in an uneasy alliance. Aceveda was very ambitious, which would lead him to make some questionable choices. He would wind up having one of the most disturbing moments on the show when he is actually assaulted by two random criminals. When this had happened, I had to take a break from the show because it was too intense for me. But that moment created one of the most controversial character arcs of the series. When they were shooting that scene, the crew was very angry at the producers because they loved Martinez and were protective of him. Detective Julian Lowe was played by Michael Jace. Julian was probably the most complex character of the show. He was a devout Christian whose strong morals put him at odds with many other officers. One of the most tragic aspects of this character was his struggles dealing with his homosexuality. Because of his religious beliefs, he felt great shame and even tried to get himself killed by not wearing a bulletproof vest to a drug bust. Eventually, he would marry a woman to convert himself. This was Michael Jace's greatest role, and after the show ended, he bounced around with some small TV appearances. Sadly, Michael Jace did not have his character's same morality, because in 2014, he would be convicted for the murder of his wife. My favorite character of the series was Detective Holland Dutch Wagenbach, played by Jay Carnes. I love Dutch. He was incredibly smart and loyal to his partner, Detective Claudette Wims, played by the amazing CCH Pounder. Wims and Dutch were the best detectives on this show. They were perfect for each other, since Wims could pull back Dutch from letting his ego get the best of him. This aspect of the character was the biggest flaw that he faced. His egotistical nature made him make sloppy mistakes that caused serious damage to innocent people. For example, he blamed himself when his arrogance may have caused the death of a woman being held by serial killers. Sometimes he even caused people to relapse into crime, like when he interrogated an offender, which set him off to commit an assault. He was also constantly being pranked by the other officers. This led him to secretly bottle up his rage, and it would explode at times making him attack other people. Dutch and Vic hated each other. He thought that Vic was a low-life bully, and Vic thought that Dutch was an egomaniac who should be taken down a peg. Still, Vic secretly respected Dutch's skill as a detective. He even thought that Dutch was a threat to the strike team, since he knew he was smart enough to find out about their crimes. I could go on and on about how cool Dutch was, but I think the best example was this scene, when he takes down a serial killer, who'd been embarrassing him in front of the other detectives in the episode. You thought by having a gun and a badge that they'd respect you. They do. Even in a uniform, you were still a joke. That's why you became a detective. You're still the same lonely kid from high school. And at the end of the day, when you look in the mirror, you don't see the person that you wish you were. 
just a lowly civil servant that you hoped you'd never become. A few moments later. Pasadena PD just dug two bodies out of it. How many more are we gonna find, Sean? Five? Ten? <laughs> Seventeen. <laughs> it's just under the crawl space, you know? The other ones I dumped, I ran out of room under my aunt's house. It's pathetic. What is? How typical you are. As soon as you're caught, you try to be special. I killed 22 people. Well, 23 if you want to count the hunting accident back in Rockford. Oh, I'm special, all right. If you're so special, how come a lowly civil servant like me just caught you? That was such a badass scene. God, I love this show. Another favorite of mine was Claudette Wims, played by CCH Pounder. Like I said, her character's relationship with Dutch was one of my favorite aspects of the show. Unlike Dutch, Wims never bragged about her ability to get criminals convicted. She was quiet and determined. She was the master at manipulating criminals into incriminating themselves. Pounder was incredible in this role, and since the show ended, every performance I see her in just elevates the project that she's involved in. Every character on The Shield was a multifaceted and fleshed out role. It seemed like that they all had arcs and would evolve throughout the series. Even small parts with little screen time would make a deep impact on the main cast. There are so many characters on this show that I wish I could talk about, but we would be here for three hours if I tried to go over them. As I stated, the storylines on The Shield were amazing. You just couldn't trust anything. Characters who hated each other would work together, others who were friends would betray one another, and some who were seen as a joke would become serious threats. Like I said, The Shield did not shy away from showing how ugly and horrible crime could be. It wasn't just the serial killers and sexual predators. One of the perfect examples was an episode that was about a street vendor who was shot by a preteen named Oleman. Oleman wanted to join a gang and as an initiation was sent to kill this vendor. During the interrogation, he confesses to Wim that he shot the vendor, and that when he goes to jail, he's going to be with his real family. Another aspect of the show was police corruption and brutality. Some police officers were practically criminals, always looking out for themselves. Sometimes they crossed the line to serve justice, or what they thought was justice. One of the perfect examples was internal affairs detective John Cavanaugh, played by Oscar-winning actor Forrest Whitaker. Cavanaugh was put on the case of exposing Vic and the strike team's corruption, but as the season went on, he became obsessed with taking down Vic and his teammates. He became almost like Inspector Javert, chasing down Jean Valjean. Eventually, he crossed the line and began to use illegal tactics like planting evidence, and intimidating witnesses to commit perjury. Funny story, Chiklis said, Forrest Whitaker, when he did the fifth year, he would become so angry. <laughs> like, well, not angry, confounded. I think he, he'd like come up to me and just go like, they hate me. They hate me. Like people are like yelling at me on the street, like leave Mackie alone. I'm like, I'm, a, I'm the good guy here, you know. <laughs> I'm trying to get this murderer and, you know, I just, he couldn't wrap his head around it. It was freaking him out. This is exactly the dilemma that Ryan said he found himself in. Sean said that he intended to portray Vic as a social experiment. How far could Vic go until the audience turned on him? So every season he showed Vic crossing the line to get his way. He stole and he schemed for his own ends. Sean Ryan said that he was shocked to learn that the audience never did, saying, quote, No matter what we had Vic do, viewers loved him and saw him as a white knight. It was crazy. The Shield was also having a real-life effect on the show, as the crew were told that if they were to ever get pulled over by a cop in L.A. to not have any DVDs or other proof that could reveal that they worked on the show. The LAPD was very angry at what was being exposed on television, and they made their feelings known. It makes sense, since the show was ahead of its time. 
it dared to display how easy corruption could take hold of anyone, even with the best of intentions. How some police officers can be just as bad as the criminals they put away. It was showing people that the world is not as black and white as they thought it was. But by the seventh season, the ratings were down, and everyone wanted to move on. So everything came to a head, and Vic finally got exposed as a criminal. Yet he still got away with it, after striking a deal with ICE. This finale is considered one of the best endings in TV history. I won't spoil it for you, but I will say that Sean studied the finales of other TV shows, and wrote what worked, and ignored what didn't. I'd say that was a good call. So, should the show come back? Well, at one point there was talk about doing a spin-off with Dutch, but the network passed on it. I think the best explanation on The Shield ever coming back was stated in this article for Entertainment Weekly in February 2022, where FX chairman John Landgraf said, quote, I don't think you could portray the level of violence perpetrated against people of color, primarily by a white set of police officers. It'd just be too triggering and traumatizing, because it was made when it was made. If somebody chooses to watch it now, I think it holds up really, really well. But do I think you could be making episodes of The Shield and putting them out on television today? No, I don't think you can. In fact, the whole cop genre is in a bit of a crisis right now, because we just have a deeper knowledge of the complexities and racial inequities of the criminal justice system. And I, for one, wholeheartedly agree. Let's just leave it as it is, as an amazing show that pushed the envelope and was indeed ahead of its time. If you have never seen the show and you're curious, or if you just want to revisit it like myself, you can see The Shield for yourself on Hulu. Well, at least the time of me writing this episode anyway. I highly suggest that you watch The Shield. It still holds up. Just remember that if you ever break the law and cross paths with a Vic Mackey yourself, then run. I'm Jesse Shade speaking on behalf of David Arroyo for JoeBlow.com, and thanks again for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to the Joe Blow Originals channel. Tell all your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company that appreciates all of your support, and we will see you next time on the next episode of Gone But Not Forgotten.